Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank Claude and, and Jim for, for inviting me, or the organizers in general, um, to give a presentation here, this very exciting um, meeting. I think that the program is, is, is really exciting. Um, so what I will do is I will give an overview of about some of the work that we have been done with tight binding models to look at the electronic and optical properties of in-GAN systems. And the work has been going on for several years now. So we had f um, financial support from the European Union to seven framework projects, Science Foundation Ireland, and also Sustainable Energy Ireland. So I don't think, given that this was probably covered a lot yesterday, but since it's a broad audience, I thought I'd bring up this slide. This is the, the, usually the slide that you have. Why are nitrides interesting? Because in principle, you can cover a very wide emission wavelength range with three materials, indium nitride, gallium nitride, and aluminum nitride. Strong chemical bonds make them very inter um, interesting for high power devices. However, we have to remind ourselves as well that these systems are very different from what we usually know from other three, five materials like indium arsenide, gallium arsenide. That starts in the first place with the underlying crystal structure. While in indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, we usually have a zinc blend system. Here we deal with the wood side structure. And the wood side structure has some particularities. And one of these particularities is that it allows for a spontaneous polarization, for instance. We have piezoelectric effects, which are strain induced, but we have also a spontaneous polarization contribution. So if you look at standard, and to keep things simple, I look at a gallium nitride well embedded in aluminum nitride, a toy system that is grown along the OO1 direction. And if you have the spontaneous polarization present in the system, you get these surface or interface charges because of the discontinuity in the polarization vector fields in the three different, or in the two different materials, basically. And this leads to a very strong electrostatic built-in field. This, as a result, gives us the, the well-known spatial separation between electron and whole wave functions. That is obviously not what we want to have if we have such a system, because it limits our um, radiative properties. And this is seen experimentally that such a field is there. If you look, for example, the decay time, this given nanoseconds here for a single gallium nitride quantum well embedded in aluminum nitride, you can see that with increasing the well width, um, the, the, the decay time here starts to increase. Or if you look at the peak energy, it starts to drop even below the gallium nitride um, unstrained band edge. So that is just to remind you that, that, that we have this system, um, or these nitride systems have very have features which are very different from what we are maybe known from other three, five materials, like indium arsenide, gallium arsenide. Even though this material is so interesting and it's so rich in his physics, there are obviously then also some several questions which are still under discussion or are not well understood. There's the green gap problem. So if we want to have a green emitter purely based on indium gallium nitride, for example, that is actually a challenge, and that is now in the literature as, for example, the green gap problem. And there are different explanations where it comes from and how we might be able to overcome it. Additionally, and that's probably why, why we came here together, the question was then always, why are these materials working at all? You have very high defect densities, and if you would have this in indium arsenide, gallium arsenide, the system would be basically dead. Yeah? So, and the reason, or one of the widely used explanations for this is, if you, have, if you look at an in-gun corner well, you have the alloy fluctuations here. This is a TEM picture shown here with the fluctuations in the, in the in-gun region. Um, early studies then, by positron annihilation measurement by Chichibu et al. Um, showed then if you have these fluctuations, put indium in there, that you can have strong carrier localization effects, and that should keep the carriers away from the defects. There are further indications that we have these strong localization effects experimentally. If you look at the PL peak positions as a function of the temperature, you get this well-known S-shape behavior. So that you see, you can get a redshift in the PL peak energy with increasing temperature. Then it goes up, blue shifting, red shifting. And that, the explanation here was that you have thermal redistribution of carriers between localized states. So this gives strong indication of wave function localization effects. And with this, we should also expect that there are a range of localized states in these systems in terms of an energy range. So the question we wanted to address here is, can we establish or find out or what are the correlations between the most simple approximation, a random alloy, and wave function localization effects? However, if you, if you look at this and you think in terms of an atomistic description, that is actually nothing that is so straightforward. We had this discussion yesterday already in, in Yuran Wu's, after Yuran Wu's um, talk, 
when we're dealing with a nanostructure, we're not only dealing with the active region, we have the barrier material, and if the alloy fluctuations are there, I need also to take into account that I have in-plane dimensions. So realistically, or what I need least probably, are something around 10,000 atoms to treat the different regions. Yeah? If you think about standard DFT, and I'm not talking about any linear scaling DFT series or orbital free DFT, you go for standard density functional theory, this is out of reach, basically. Um, so what is the microstructure is important. How can we address this problem? So our aim was here to develop an atomistic or semi-empirical atom, or an empirical atomistic description of the electronic and optical properties of nitride-based system of realistic size that allows us to deal with 10,000 of atoms. And at the same time accounts for deviations from the ideal structure by random alloy fluctuation, interface roughness, velvet fluctuation, so on and so forth. And that brings me to the outline of my talk. I will briefly discuss the theoretical framework we have set up here to address this question. Then I will talk a little bit about the electronic and optical properties of seaplane system. I will say something about general aspects. We'll talk about something that, that um, we have recently looked at together with some experimentalists um, from Cambridge and Manchester on the mobility edge. And I will then talk a little bit about excitonic effects in, in such a disordered system and also in, or basically in a quantum well system. And if time permits, I would like to look at um, M-plane systems as well, excitonic effects here, and then also how carrier localization affects the degree of optical linear polarization. So let me start with the theoretical framework first. So our approach was here that we want to have modeling across different scales. So as a starting point, we have first principles or DFT calculations, which allow us um, to have a benchmark of our more empirical models, but at the same time provide also input like material parameters in the more empirical systems. Then we can establish empirical atomistic models for bulk systems. As I said, we can take data from the first principles or benchmark it against here, the DFT. And then we have also empirical atomistic models for alloys and nanostructures. And we can then, or what we're also working on is, is connecting then this empirical methods to even higher order systems, I would say, or continuum-based models for nanostructures and devices. I will not talk about the last bit. I will just focus on the first three steps. Yeah? So as I just said, starting point is the function theory. We use this for small-scale systems, so insight into from first principles. Then we have developed local strain, like VFF models here, and a built-in potential theory um, that allows us to, to take um, alloy fluctuations into account in the polarization effect. And also, we'll talk about a little bit about tight binding parameterizations. Then we set up large-scale supercells with different compositions, which are random alloy fluctuations, or we have composition clustering, maybe. Quantum wells, or quantum dots, what we did recently. Feeds this into Schrodinger's equation. So we have to do here the numerically heavy thing to calculate single particle states and energies, not via the localization landscape theory. So um, we solve Schrodinger's equation, get single particle states and energies. Then we calculate if we want to look at excitonic effects, for example, Coulomb matrix elements or dipole matrix elements. And usually we do then a CI calculation for excitonic effects. Combined with the Fermi's golden rule, we can go to the optical spectra then, building on all this. I don't have time to go through the full thing, so I would like to focus on two things. First of all, the local polarization theory, and then moving on to type binding in a minute. So first of all, I showed you this slide before, and I said, oh, we keep it simple. I go for gallium nitride embedded in aluminum nitride. Yeah? As long as I, I mean, the interface is critical as well, but as long as I have no alloy fluctuation, you might say that is something I, I, I know approximately how to deal with. However, what happens now if I have an in-gun system where the alloy content is strongly fluctuating? So what about local or microscopic effects? So what we developed here, or we, what we did here, is basically we tried to break up the, macros or the polarization vector field in a nitride system into a macroscopic contribution and a local contribution. So macroscopic contribution is dependent on the clamped iron contribution, or the clamped iron term here, which means if you think about this, you have a box and you randomly distribute the atoms in there, you don't allow the system um, locally to relax. That is your clamped iron contribution. I would call this a macroscopic part. And then we have this local part, which is related to our bond asymmetry parameters. This is basically the bond length of the different bonds here. And we have basically something that is the case in the equilibrium position. And then we have a contribution that is after we relax the system, what are the new bond lengths? And this gives us basically a correction to the macroscopic part that is, when we develop this, linear and strain. When I say linear and strain, linear and internal strain. Yeah? 
So for, for binaries, this is a very good approximation because, for example, if you look at the, what we did here with the, um, with the Born effective charges, they are assumed that the neighboring atoms are always piezoelectrically um, the same. So for a binary material, this is obviously a good approximation or a good assumption. But um, for alloys, that, that requires um, testing if this is a good approximation. So what we did is we performed LDA berry phase calculations on a copper platinum-like structure, where we have in this copper platinum-like structure, we have just four atoms in the system, one indium, one gallium, and two nitrogen. And we calculated um, with, with LDA, basically, um, the berry phase. And berry phase is only determined then as a, as a difference in polarization. That's what we used here. We have delta P. So our reference value is here, um, basically, this structure without the relaxed, or just putting these atoms basically in the system, and then we displace the, the atoms from the structure and calculate the new polarization. The value itself is not important, it's just the difference in the polarization, yeah? And we did the same with the local polarization model. And if the two models agree for the same structure and the same input, all the data points should line up nicely on the diagonal, which they do quite well. Then the question was, what happens in a random system? So we took a 128 atom supercell, in Garn here, and we put the atoms in there randomly, relax the structures, and calculate again the delta P from the berry phase, and for the same structure, delta P from our local polarization theory. And if the two agree, the data points should line up on the diagonal, which they do to a good degree. Yeah? So that gives us a first indication that the local polarization theory is doing a good job. Now the question was, I didn't address the, the local effect. If you think about the berry phase calculation, as, if you don't know how to partition the system, the berry phase gives you an average polarization over the supercell. So we don't get any insight into the local features that contribute to this. Our local polarization theory does. So we have a widespread of these local, local effects, and the average of this gives us our data points in here. So we not only have the average polarization, we have also the local fluctuations. So now the question is, so this is in good agreement for the three analogs compared to LDA calculations, and the question is, yeah? Yeah. That, that distribution is not centered at zero? Uh, no, because we have, a, we have a, this is PZ, and we have a, a finite polarization, basically. So, finite, so the averaging of that is a finite. Yes, yeah, that gives me a data point in here. So I'm just averaging over all this, and this is the average delta P. Yeah? Do, you think the, do you think the polarization is that local? Uh, it's the same, you have a you have real local economic scale fluctuation. Yeah, can I come to this now? Yes. That's the next slide, basically, oh, okay. where I look at this. <laughs> So now, yeah. C, coulomb per square coulomb. meter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so it's an electrical. Yeah. And it's in, it's in one particular. That direction. is the P, I should have said that that is PZ, P3, the, the Z component. I could do the same thing for PX and PY of the vector field. Yeah. Okay, I come now to your question. So the question is is this important or not? So, if I'm in a continuum-based picture and I would say I have GAN, in GAN, gallium nitride, obviously I have a polarization along the C-axis, but my growth is long now along a non-polar direction. So from a classical picture or from a continuum-based picture, I would say there is no discontinuity in the polarization vector field, and this should be an ideally field-free system, and this is why you want to study the non-polar case. That's when we do this type of calculation with our local polarization theory, and I calculate the local building potential from a point dipole model, the interface of the quantum well is here. I have even taken into account a step here, but we do, wouldn't have to do this. And the local fluctuations then give us local build and potential fluctuations, which are in magnitude comparable to what we have in a seaplane system, for instance. So from this perspective, you can see that this kind of feature should also contribute to localization effects. So something that is what you think is built and field free should have local variations in the potential because of local strain effects. Yeah, you see something similar like, like these fluctuations. And this is like 20? This is volt. OK, so it's like 2K, it's several yeah. K. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's quite a big effect, but yeah. We have, this is basically a local effect then. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So you, you emphasized the fluctuations yeah. within the in-gan. But there is a discontinuity in polarization between GAN and in -gan. Mm -hmm for which you need an absolute number for polarization. How, how do you get that? 
So that is basically from the clamped iron contribution, where there's the macroscopic part. And, and what do you use as an input for that? Uh, I was expecting this question probably. So what we used is we have done DFT, uh, DFT calculations similar to what we had from um, what Bernardini and Fiorentini did with the reference of the 111 system. I'm aware of this work now with the hexagonal system. It gives you a different value, but as far as I understand, for moderate indium contents in the lower range, that should be comparable. If you make two mistakes that happen to yes, the but these these are usually compensating in in usually compensating in this, this standard approach for Inga. In the standard approach, where you assume a homogeneous alloy, but what I'm worried about is that you're now putting in inhomogeneities, and it may be more important to do it correctly. Could be, yeah, but that would then then yeah, we could, we could basically change the the clamped iron contribution because the other bits are dependent on on basically just the bond bond asymmetry parameter. That comes out how the system relaxes. And the, the bond effective charges. So this is a local contribution. So that, that would be this. The clamped ion contribution could be different depending on what is your reference state, what is the spontaneous polarization. But then you have to bear in mind that obviously there are differences in polarization that play a role here. Yeah? So I think, yeah, the absolute value might shift, but the fluctuations sit on top of this. Yeah. yeah. Further questions? So I'm probably running late already, so I, I am. But <laughs> <laughs> so we might. how I got into this. Yeah. I mean, these, this the problem so much like yesterday. Because when we have algand barriers with an M plane, it's also porous for percolation. So these, exactly the same effect as I showed in two plane. Yeah. Does that, does that follow the indium? If you map the indium composition, yeah, I think we had a look and we see that, that it is basically happening around in the Indian where you have the distortion of the lattice. Yeah? Great. Okay. <laughs> so, I may, so I now come to the tight binding. Um, and what we did here is we basically used density functional theory, hybrid functional DFT, to calculate the bulk band structures in the first step. And then we use an SP3 tight binding model to basically reproduce characteristic features where we are mainly interested in the gamma point because this is where the light emission absorption here happens. But you can see our tight binding fit gives also a very good description of the, the values or the, the band structure near the edges of the first brilliant zone. So equipped with this, I need now to do something that I can benchmark this for a ternary material. And what we did here, and we started this discussion already this morning, is um, I looked at the band gap boring in nitride alloys. So I took data from Chris van der Waller's group here by habit functional DFT for this <coughs> system, and also some experimental data. Our type binding result is given by the blue circles here. We have calculated this over the full composition range. And what we can see is our type binding data, when we have a 12,000 atom supercell, random alloy, assumed here we have repeated this calculation five times for each composition, include local strains, so VFF relaxed systems, the local built-in fields, and we go to get, go to get a good agreement with HSE, DFT, and experiment over the full composition range. So what is the Boeing parameter? So the Boeing parameter for me is basically the variation of the ground state transition between the... Oh, the value here, that is around... I mean, we did it composition depend, but I think on average it was like of 1.8 EV or something like this for indium nitride. Yeah? And we did this also because you mentioned yesterday also aluminum indium nitride. We looked at this, and that is a material that is, that is very unusual, I think. And um, we looked at the band gap boring parameter here together with um, the group of uh, Rob Martin and, and um, Peter Parbuk. And we calculated the, the evolution of our band gap here as a function of, of the composition and had some experimental data from Peter and Rob's group and also experimental data. And you can see this lines up quite nicely, but when we tried to fit this with this equation here, it didn't work out so nicely. So it was already introduced by, I think, Rudyard Goldhans group that this Boeing parameter should be composition dependent. And we did this. So if we have a low indium content and use just the endpoints, 15% and this endpoint here, we get a Boeing parameter of around 15.4 EV. And here in the higher composition range, it starts to be 3.9 EV. So that's a very unusual material. And um, yeah. So that's how we benchmark our tight binding model, basically. And now I want to just come to some, some general aspects here um, of carrier localization in seaplane systems. So we have these fluctuations. Experimental data gives us very broad PL line widths here. So that is then already an indication 
in addition to the, to the S-shape behavior, so on and so forth, that we should have carrier localization <coughs> effects. So we wanted to get insight with this framework now in the, the underlying physics. And what we did is we take a 82,000 atom supercell, approximately 10 by 9 pi excuse 10. Me, yeah. Can we go back to a thermostat? Where do you see, where do you see localization? Because we assume that, that the, broad, the broadening of the line width is coming from basically the a different, shall we say, localization centers that, that contribute to this. So where the bump is the phonon replicas? This, the phonon replicas, yeah. Okay. But that is not taken into account. We're just looking now at what happens if we de randomly distribute this. Well, the phonon replica is because the X station is quite localized. Well, what's interesting here is that the phonon replica intensity increases with medium content. Mm -hmm. So it means that the localization has an effect of the intensity of the replica, yeah. which is correct. Which looks is like an organic to me. It's well that. It looks like an organic to yes. me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure how far I will get, <laughs> but um, that is, that is um, the supercell we are using, 82,000 atoms. I assume here we have different well widths, so um, 3.5 in this case. We have done calculations for 5, 10, 15, 25%. I will not go into all the full details here. And we usually use, it, I would say, the weakest approximation by a random alloy distribution. We could you, talk about clustering and these kind of things. I know that is under discussion and just, okay. <laughs> It's always, it's, I go for a random alloy. <laughs> so, um, and we, we repeat these calculations now several times. And there are also reports about velvet fluctuation. I assume this, this depends a little bit also on, on gross techniques maybe. But um, we include this here as a disk-like object um, with a five nanometer diameter and two monolayer height. So what I want to do is in the first place, I said already that the broadening of the PL width might, might come from um, variations um, basically from different, different configurations, shall we say. So therefore, what we did is we calculated the, the variation of the energy gap, the ground state emission, basically, um, for a given configuration at a given content x and subtracted the average um, ground state or the average trans the ground state transition energy for a given context for a given composition. That is this. So everything is scattered now around zero here, and we have done this for 10, 15, 25% for five different configurations. And you can see we have quite significant fluctuations in the ground state trans transition energy. And even at 10%, we have a noticeable effect. It's a black line here, so it goes up and down. So the question was, what is causing these variations? And we obviously have now to look at electron hole energies, and I will do this for the 10% case. For, for higher indium contents, we have a similar, we find similar features, um, but I will focus on just this. Do the same thing, take the ground state energy for electrons and holes separately for a given configuration n and subtract the average value. That's what you have here, the average ground state energy as a function of the configuration number or the delta E, I should say, for a given configuration. And you see we have some fluctuations here, but if you take these two configurations, the fluctuations are, or the, the variation is quite small, but we can have large fluctuations if I take these two. For the holes, you probably can't see this really, it's a green, oh, well, it's okay, the green line. You see that the fluctuations are much, much more strong right here. So that the whole ground state energy seems to be much, much more sensitive to what the local configuration is. So, to check this, we look basically at isosurface plots of the ground state, electron, and hole charge densities for such a system. The black dashed line is the quantum well interface. You can see the well with fluctuation here, and we have the lower, um, the lower interface here. Green, it's probably hard to see. Here's the whole ground state, it's strongly localized. Red, I have the electron ground state charge density as these isosurface plots at different values of the maximum charge density. The built-in field spatially separates the carriers, but you can see the hole is much, much more strongly localized um, by the alloy fluctuations, electron more spread out. Weak effect here. And we have this asymmetry here, which is also consistent with some recent work, I think, by, by Manos group here, and also Duncan Watson, Paris, back in 2011. And when we did this for DFT, we saw a similar effect. And I will come to this if I have time for larger indium contents later on, but um, you see a similar or the well-width fluctuations then become, start to become even more important in these systems. Well, yeah? You estimated the size of the hole laid by 
I come to this in a minute. Yeah? So um, now the question is how to measure this. These are nice pictures to look at, but how do we quantize, quantize localization? And one thing that we have tried to do or used here is the inverse participation ratio. There are different definitions of this. What is the participation ratio and what is an inverse participation ratio? I'm sticking here to the definition of Wegener. Yeah? So therefore, my IPR is, is related to the modulus 4 of the wave function. In a tight binding model, this would correspond then to here summing up a localized basis state, which could be an S, P, X, P, Y, P, Z orbiter, and an expansion coefficient. I sum this up over all the lattice sites that I have in the system. So I just give you a brief example what this could tell us. Yeah? So let's say I have a lattice with seven sites here, given here, and at each I have a basis state of a Gaussian orbital shown here. If I have a delocalized state, I can construct such a delocalized state in the following way, that each basis state has an amplitude of square root of 1 over 7 here. If I calculate the IPR value, I get something like 1 over 7. So if n is large, if I have a delocalized state, the IPR value should be small in our definition here. If I have a localized state, the IPR value should be large. Only one orbital contributes here. So I should have a large IPR value. So forget all this. The take-home message, larger IPR values, stronger localization. So we started to look now at basically how the ground state energies or how the electron ground states, the localization measure why the IPR values changes. So this is, instead of now confuse you even more, instead of showing this as a configuration number, I've plotted this as the energy of the respective ground states for a 10% indium nitride, gallium nitride, 90% well, seaplane system. I've taken now this number here, so don't be surprised if this is one. I've normalized everything to this state, which for the electrons was the highest number. But you can see there are some fluctuations, but they don't look that, that big. Why do I say this? Because I already looked at the inverse participation ratio of the holes. And you can see we can get these massive localization effects already in 10%. So some of the configurations are really, really strong localized, but the others as well. That is consistent what we have seen, that the energy is strongly changing, that um, the local configuration plays an important role. So we have actually what I said before, the whole wave function is very sensitive to the local environment. And we have this much, much stronger localization effect here. Now the question is that was what you are asking, um, and what about the carrier localization lengths? So if you go back to Taulis, he defined basically why are the IPR value a localization length while this, an average lattice constant, shall we say, here in a cubic system, and the IPR value gives us a localization length if I'm taking this to the power of one, to the power of minus one, minus one over three. That's a cubic approximation. That is probably for our seaplane system not a good approximation because we know already that the built-in field which separates the carriers along the growth direction. So I would expect that there's an asymmetry in the, in the localization length. So what we tried here is to distinguish between in and out of plane. And for the out of plane one, we use something similar. So we calculate the planar integrated probability density. So we bring all the probability density into one point. It's not dependent on where it sits in the plane. So it's just a, a, a quantity that tells me where is the probability of finding the carrier in a particular plane. And then I use the same thing then here, what, I, what, what was done by Taulis here. I, I define a planar value of this. Then I have an average lattice spacing along the z-axis. I should have maybe used c here for the c lattice constant. And then I have the state index. So I can do a similar approach for the in-plane localization length, but I don't have time to go into this here. And then I wanted also to see if we can get an energy resolved localization length. So that is, would be important if we want to see how is the localization change changing in the valence band, for example. Not only ground set, I want to see how it penetrates deeper into the valence band. To do this, we have taken 5%, 15%, oh, very good, you should swap this here, 15 10%, 25%, and 175 different configurations per indium content. Calculate 20 electron, 40 hold states for each of these configurations, and then these states were all grouped into bins of width 30 MeV. And then I calculate, the, I get the localization lengths for each configuration for each state, basically, but then I put this onto a long or bin all these values and then average by the number of, of elements I have in each bin to get the average localization length in a given energy range. Yeah. And I show you now the results. In the first place, I look at the average ground state. So I just take the ground state from each of the configurations. If I do this and plot this now as a PL peak energy, 
There's also some experimental data by, by, by Cambridge or Manchester and Cambridge here, where they measured one from the Huang Rees factors at low temperature, such a localization length. You can see now our calculations here. We have the circles are always the circles are always the um, the in-plane localization lengths, and the triangles are always uh, the out-of-plane localization lengths. The out-of-plane localization length is expected to be um, smaller because you have the built-in strong electrostatic built-in field, which forces the, the, the carriers to sit in a certain plane. So, and then we have the in-plane part. The first thing we notice is with decreasing PL energy, increasing indium content, we have a decrease in the localization length. That probably makes sense because the indium content gets higher, built-in field gets stronger, for example. Then the out-of-plane localization length, as I said, is probably dominated by the built-in field. And the in-plane one, you can see, is actually then very different between electrons and holes. And that is consistent with the picture I've shown you before, that the electron wave function wants to spread out while the whole wave function starts to localize. And you can see at least our, or these localization lengths we have here are in good agreement with what has been measured or extracted from Huang Ri's measurements on these systems. So now the question was, how does the, I want to have a measure how localization spreads over an energy range. So what we have calculated now is this energy resolved localization length. I do this binning now here, and I'm always measuring this now with respect to the respective bent edges. So all my calculations are set to zero here. They will obviously be different because the valence band edge will be different for the different systems. But if I'm referencing this back here, you can get the data then always with reference to the respective valence band edge. We have 5%, 10%, 15%, 25% here. And that is the in-plane localization length. And you can see then, obviously, in the lower or close to the valence band edge, the localization length for the different systems is not that different. But then when I start to go deeper into the valence band, the localization length starts to increase. And with increasing indium content, um, with increasing indium content, I have obviously a wider range of localized state before this starts to, to come up here. The 5% already starts to, starts to go to larger values in this case. So we can see that, that carrier localization um, extends over a wide range from this already. I would expect that this should be also then relevant for higher carrier densities, increased temperatures. So now I will briefly touch on carrier localization effects and how we might get an insight into these kind of, um, of, of behavior, or can, can, can we see it to some degree? And here I, I just give a brief overview of what has been done experimentally, and then um, I will go back to our theoretical, um, or our attempt to get some first insight into this behavior. So there were in-gown quantum works drawn by MOVPE in Cambridge. I should say there's a joint work with Cambridge and Manchester and also with Queen Mary. Um, college now in London, um, they were grown by quasi 2T temperature, and the indium content was approximately 17%. They repeated the experiments that I will show you in a minute um, for different growth settings where you have a um, where you have a 2T temperature, where this leads actually to gro gross well width um, well width fluctuation of the order of 50 to 100 ME, uh, 50 to 100 nanometers. So what the results I will be showing was independent of the two structures. So what was concluded from this is that the alloy microstructure on the lateral scale below these Wavitz fluctuations is responsible for what is happening in the experiment. I don't have time to go through the full experimental studies. I would just try to summarize it here. So what is shown here is a PL spectra for an excitation energy that is high above the band gap, or of, yeah, high above the band gap, shall we say. And it's a low temperature result. So what has been done is now, this was measured as a function of the photon excitation energy. And this one is then, when you start to bring the photon excitation energy down, is you follow the PL peak energy. The, the PL spectrum stays also the same, but I've summarized it here. We just look at the PL peak energy. So if we start to vary the photon, or if they start to vary the photon energy, you can basically see that the PL peak position stays the same, and the PL spectra seems to be almost unchanged when you do this unless or until you hit a critical energy where you bring the photon excitation energy within the PL spectrum. Then suddenly the PL peak energy as well as the PL spectra starts to be modified and in this case the PL peak energy starts to basically decrease. So the question once is then do we have a change in physics here? Do carrier localization effects change in different energy ranges? And as I have just said, with the localization length, maybe there is some indication already. 
So a cartoon picture of this. So we excite an electron hole pair, and I will do this now in the first place in a simple, just single particle picture. Yeah? You excite this into, into the conduction band. Then you have, obviously, the situation that the carriers can basically redistribute, given all of the localized states here. Um, but then the question was, is there maybe a difference in the mobility of the carriers to distribute among the different states when we start to vary the excitation energy? So a complete picture would then include Coulomb effects. It would include um, calculating electron phonon scattering effects, all these kind of things. So what we decided to do, to have a very first initial insight into this, we calculated the modulus wave function overlap between a state n and a state m at a given lattice size. So if we do this, we can calculate this for electrons and for holes. The good thing about doing it this way is that our overlaps will be normalized to 1. The maximum overlap I can get here is always 1. Yeah? Because I, if I take the electron wave function at the same state, the modular square of this normalized wave function is 1. If I have no overlap, the overlap should be 0. So that will give us a first indication how the, the carriers might be able to redistribute in the energy landscape. Yeah? Uh, no, because that's just the lattice size. It's just for one particular configuration. So I look always, do the carriers sit at the same lattice site or not? So I have one at this point. Well, I look at always the overlap in the same lattice site and then go to different lattice sites. So if they are not in the same spatial position, this overlap should be zero. If they are sitting on top of each other, I get a contribution. If it's the same state, I obviously sum up all of this and it gives me one. Yeah? And if you're in a type binding picture, you could argue, well, this is something like a mobility of a carrier hopping from one state to another. Yeah. Again, I do this energy resolved, the same procedure what I described before, 15% in Garn Cornwell, 175 configurations. In this case, I'm, I'm, the electrons you will see are not that interesting. So we have five electrons here, 40 whole states, 175 configuration. Do this binning again and averaging then over the different elements per bin. Excuse me. You missed one line. You didn't tell us about incentive to mobility. This one? Yes. Yeah, as, as I said, it is, it is just like I calculate the wave function overlap. In principle, I would have to calculate an electron phonon matrix element overlap. But I said in a tight binding picture, if I have overlap between wave functions at the size, that gives me something like an effect of hopping or mobility then. Why? Because I just look at the overlaps of one state with another state. And if they are starting to overlap, it's like a hopping probability. Uh, if I have a larger overlap, the probability okay, is higher. But, but if, it, if it hops without some energy, I, so it's a constant energy, so I can see what you see. Yeah. But you observe. Can, can I just come to the next yes. picture? Yeah. As I said, this is a very initial insight into this. Yeah? Yeah? OK, so what I wanted to do is I calculated now the overlap between a different, shall we say I have a state at an energy of 3.02, and I want to know what is the overlap as a state in a different energy range. So if the overlap is quite large, that gives me a first insight that I have a large overlap between the different states. Yeah? It's not like that I'm saying I'm calculating now this is the strength of going there. I just, if there is no overlap, then I would have no transition from one state to another. Yeah? OK, cool. Um, so this is the energy resolved data. So I just like enough to look at one of the upper or lower parts that is symmetric around this. This would be the conduction band edge, and I have the valence band, or oh, deeper in the conduction band edge in here. And as you can see, as I said, this were five electrons. This is not very interesting. The overlaps are basically independent of the energy. So it would be easy in this first insight to transfer between different sides. There's no significant, yeah. Yeah? We can, we can discuss it later. How do you conserve energy if you are more than one electron? I'm just saying I'm looking at a first, to get a first insight what is happening in the two different, in, for electrons and holes. I'm not saying that I'm explaining now, oh, this is the number that you need to do this. Then I do the same thing for the holes. And you can see this is the conduction, or the valence band edge here, and I have deeper into the valence band here. And this picture changes strongly. So if I get carriers into these localized states, it is probably a different situation of being able to transfer between the states. So the overlap strongly depends on the energy range where we are. Um, if I go into, I can have delocalized states deeper into the valence band. I can have localized states near the valence band edge. And then I have also, for lack of a better word, these kind of semi-localized states. Yeah? 
So there are these different regimes that we see here. So if I now go to the situation that I'm exciting the, the, the system well above the, um, shall we say this, what I would call the mobility edge, then the carriers are hopefully free to, to move this. As I said, this is a cartoon picture. So then I have the full set of um, localized states available. So this is why my PL spectrum is probably not changing so much. And then I can do the same thing if I'm below the critical energy and I'm in one of these strongly localized states, and then it would be probably very difficult to scatter into different states. Because, I mean, the wave function overlap with neighboring states should be smaller. So this is obviously only a subset of available localized states that, that we have then excited in the experiment. And therefore, you could expect, or maybe expect, that the redistribution of the carries is different and your PL spectrum starts to change. Can I check yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there's still enough overlap. No, it's between electrons and electrons and holes and holes because it's just the distribution, how the carriers can move through this potential landscape then. Or at first glance, yeah? Between the electrons and holes is enough to allow luminescence. Lumin I, 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 the luminescence, what you mean is then, then I would have to calculate electron hole wave function overlaps. Question, did you exclude in this plot, you would probably use some energy broadening to make a plot? As I said, did I have... You did you exclude the diagonal term, each state with itself on the diagonal term? No, no, it, it, it is there, but, but I mean, it's, it's just like they, I've binning them, so I take all the energies that I'm getting, putting them into a law, in a bin, you or in, 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 in a vector, yeah. and then, the yes, the yeah. Okay, because later today I'm showing a plot where there is nothing on the diagonal, essentially. Okay, so yeah, different, so okay. Yeah. Clarification question. In, in these plots, these black wavy solid lines, those are just, no, no, in the lower plot. This. Uh, the, those band edge lines, those this. are just lines to guide the eye. Guide to eye. There's a cartoon picture, as I said. Yeah, you, you, you don't calculate those, you don't use those. Uh, no, no, no. Well, it is basically in there, the potential landscape, so I have this kind of, of fluctuation in the potential landscape. But, but this do is you just. you know what those energies are quantitatively? Yeah. Well, they should, this is cartoon. This one is what I'm getting from the tight binding analysis. So I could try to calculate a local band edge, basically. But the energy that's on those axes, that's yeah. based on the dashed green lines, isn't that, it? That is based on the dashed green lines, yeah. Right, so those black solid lines. A guide to the eye, no cartoon, yeah, yes, yeah. OK, that's, as I said, a cartoon picture. Yeah. So, but they see in the experiment there, they, they, they see even that there are extra lines than in the spectrum. The phonon, the, the, the PL spectra changes quite, quite strongly. You have the, the allo phonon replica as well, but you have also extra features then. No, 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 no separately for the carrier transport. Yeah. What matters is everything below the allo phonon energy. You transport below 90 MeV. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you have, you have a ton of time to move. Yeah. But you are now resonantly. You, you, are, you are exciting now basically only a subset of carriers. Yeah? OK. So the last thing, as I said, I have done this here now on a picture which is, um, yeah. Uh, we could try to do this with the 100, 175 configuration. So we could bin them again and, and look at basically the density of states. No, but we could produce it from this. Yeah? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so excitonic effect. I did this at the moment with a, with a single particle picture. Yeah? But I have not introduced the, the Coulomb effect. So I will do this briefly here now. So I took nine different configurations as, as just um, an example. You can see again, since our um, in a single particle picture without um, the Coulomb effect using, um, using here um, Fermi's golden rule to calculate the spectra, and I have broadened each of the peaks here for, for, for guiding the eye, basically. And we have the spread and transition energies that is due to our single particle energy variations in the holes, especially. <coughs> then I switch on, or we calculate the Coulomb effects with the CI, five electrons and 15 hole states included in the CI. 
then get the many body states from the cool with the Coulomb matrix elements included. And that is what the spectrum looks like um, if we include the Coulomb effect. And as you see, there's not a huge difference between the two. And um, the, the exciton binding energy referring here as the energy difference between the single particle result and the Coulomb effect was of the order of 29 MeV on average. So yeah? what you call exciton binding energy is the difference between the energies you compute taking into account Coulomb interaction and uh, not taking into account. Yes, that is. So does that mean it's an exciton? Does that tell anything about the wave function? That's what I will do now, OK? So then the wave functions, that is the next question. So, um, and I do this for configuration one, and looking at this, it will become also clear why some of the configurations are probably dark, shall we say, or very low um, oscillator strengths. So this is the same plot I've shown you before for the 10% case. I've now went to a 25% case, and we have done it for 15 as well. You see, again, interface of the quantum well dashed lines here. Red, again, the charge densities of the electrons. Green of the holes. This is the top view, side view. You see that the well structurations now start to introduce an extra localization center, basically, giving me um, a localized electron state at, at this point here and the whole state here. So this is what I said before. Whole wave function random alloy sufficient. And the electron um, random alloy fluctuation weaker effect on the electron wave function. The well fluctuation becomes more important. And I know that there is some discussion around also that we have an in-plane separation of the carriers, which makes the oscillator strength quite small because the hole doesn't necessarily sit below the electron wave function. So that might be also related then to the green gap. So this spatial in-plane separation explains then also why you have not only, I mean, why you can get extremely low, um, extremely low oscillator strengths because this wave function might sit somewhere here. We find always that the hole in this case, uh, the electron is localized by the well width fluctuation. So now the question is what happens if I have the many body effect? That is not a trivial eff effect to calculate. So what we used here is a reduced density matrix. So in the CI, we have basically a linear combination of different configurations that can contribute to the ground state. So we traced out the hole and the electron character, and that's what we find. And we have found this for all of the configurations that actually the Coulomb effect seemed to be, to some degree, wiped off the board, at least for the wave function and for the ground state effects here, because the results look very different. You could call this now what Morel did, independently localized electrons and holes, or an indirect exciton, if you want. So um, this is something that, that looks like the single particle picture gives you already a very good description of the system in terms of this localization. Does this to some degree answer your question about the exciton, what it is? So here it's a correct electron effect. Yeah. With no relative motion change. Yeah. But this is all dominated by the interface fluctuation. True. Yeah. But therefore. But if you don't have interface fluctuation. I come to this in a minute. <laughs> it, Interface factor, so Coulomb slightly modifies the wave function here at least. So we have two, three different factors that contribute to the building field, where its fluctuations, and the random alloy fluctuations. And we have also done this for different indium contents with and without where its fluctuations and narrow wells. And if you're in a region that the well is, is too large, it's basically not, there's not a big difference. But if you come to a really small system then in terms of where it's, you can have some in-plane movement or some redistribution of the wave functions then. Yeah? And I come to this now in a non-polar system. So in a non-polar system, the building field is not there. And the properties are probably different. So I'm, I'm, I maybe just talk about this because I'm just watching the time. It's, it's, it's now, I'm probably at 50 minutes. So I would just look at the um, excitonic effect in a non-polar system. So what is a non-polar system? I introduced this basically already. Here so far, I've looked at systems that are grown along the C-axis or on the C-plane. And in a non-polar system, you grow basically on one of these facets here, which is an M-plane system then. If you do this, you should ideally end up with this situation, what I introduced in the beginning. It should be ideally field-free. That would be nice, because the wave function overlap would be very strong. No built-in field. The wave functions just sit right on top of each other. Additionally, this is very interesting for a high degree of optical linear polarization because if you grow along a different direction, you can get a splitting of the valence band and that might allow you to have just emission along one particular um, direction of the crystal. And interesting for a variety of different applications. 
So this is a seaplane system, and we just discussed here with the broadening, which is indicative of indicative of 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 yeah fluctuations or localization effects maybe. Did the same thing for an M-plane system here. That's a calculated spectra, PL spectra, and that's a PLE spectra. Um, and you can see we have a very broad PL line width here. So that tells me that, that in M-plane we have also strong localization effects. The broadening seems to be what is seen also in the, in the experimental data um, seems to be even larger than what you have in a, in a C-plane system. So the question was then, are there additional effects or alloy fluctuations here are even more important in these systems? So we use now basically our atomistic model and with input from, from um, experiment to look at one particular M-plane system here. So the samples were grown in Cambridge and characterized optically in, in, in Manchester. So we have M-plane in-gun quantum wells grown by MOVPE on freestanding M-plane substrate, GAN substrates, low defect densities and BFF density, basal plane stacking fault densities, and a quasi 2T method was, known, was used. Then they have used X-ray diffraction scanning, transmission electron microscopy, and APT, atom probe tomography, extracted well widths, um, indium contents from this. APT was used to get insight into the distribution of the indium atoms, if it's a random alloy or clustered. So the first conclusion that they have drawn here is that it is probably a, a good approximation to talk about a random alloy, but subtle differences couldn't be ruled out. Um, well with fluctuations observed, and there are some semipolar contributions as well in the system. So here's the PL and PLE spectrum of this system, and that's what we have here, the PL peak, and then we have the two light polarization um, effects then um, basically from the PLE measurements, which give us uh, the two, shall we say, the two valence subbands to some degree, if you want. Um, the PL line is very broad, 135 MeV, and we have on the low energy side also semipolar contribution, a stoke shift of 180 MeV, which is massive. Um, and the PLE splitting, or the PLE spectra then gave us also some insight into, shall we say, valence band splittings between the two, um, between the two components, as I said, perpendicular and parallel to C. So if this is, assuming that it's an intrinsic radiative process, then this is strongly suggested of um, involving localized carriers and similar to C-plane system, random alloy fluctuations are important. So another interesting feature of the PL time decay measurements, which are very different to what you have in C-plane, single exponential, and the decay time constant seems to be approximately constant across the PLE spectrum, or PL spectrum. There is something on the low energy side which I will not discuss. There are these things are starting to vary again. And this has been seen by other groups that this is a single exponential, and one of the conclusions was that we ha was drawn or tried the explanation is exciton localization effects, giving a single exponential decay transient. So as I said, this is a semipolar bit. Um, so now we try to model this. So this is the experimental data. So we took a supercell with 82,000 atoms, a well width of 2 nanometer approximately, 17% um, indium, random alloy assumed, 75 different configuration, and a disk-like well width fluctuation on top of this. So when you do this, we have calculated in the first place our exciton emission spectra and compared this to the PL data for two different light polarization vectors. You can see that, that we have a good agreement between the calculated peak position and the measured peak position. Then um, our splitting is of around 100 MeV, or our widths, full width of maximum of rough, around 100 MeV, experimentally at 175. Um, and we have a strong discrepancy or difference in the polarization characteristics when we, when we use different light polarization vectors. Um, and that is also observed in the, ex observed in the experiment. So I, I will not go back and, and talk about whole states. That I hope you believe me that this is a similar effect that we have been seeing before, but I want to say something about the Coulomb effects. So I do the same thing and plot, first of all, the single particle ground state um, charge densities. In red, the electrons, in green, the holes. For a side view, dashed lines, again, in indicating the quantum well interface. Um, for a side view and for a top view, green is a, is a whole wave function, again, strongly localized due to the fluctuations. The electron wave function starts to spread out over the quantum well region here, mainly. There are some effects from the, from the alloy fluctuations. and then. We have a similar system, yeah, well, similar to, to C-plane, but now if we do the same thing with our reduced density matrix, CIA calculation, we see that, that the electron then wants to sit where the hole is sitting because the built-in field is no longer separating the wave function. 
So that is consistent with this exciton localization picture, at least. So we see a fact that the electron always wants to localize about the hole. And I think I will skip the degree of optical linear polarization in the interest of time. We found here basically, a, a, I would say, a good agreement between theory and experiment. We are slightly below this. Um, it is quite interesting to see that if you look at the, the, the degree of optical linear polarization in red here, it's very high and constant across the PL spectra. This line width is of around 135 MeV. If you think about the valence band splitting, the valence band splitting is only 30 to 40 MeV. So why is the degree of optical linear polarization so constant if you measure across the spectrum? Because the valence band splitting is much smaller. Well, if you do this and you look at this orbital type contribution, we just checked as a function of the configuration, what is the orbital contribution of the whole states? And they are dominated mainly by PX contributions. We have some mixing to the alloy-induced effect, which give us some contributions which are higher in PZ, for example. And that explains then each configuration have a different whole energy. And if you think about the spectrum, this making up the spectra and all have the same orbital character, it is basically the localization that is giving us the width of the PL spectra plus that it only one orbital contributes here. So a simple valence band splitting picture would not explain this feature. <coughs> that brings me to the summary. I discussed established tight binding model, local polarization theory, talked about the wave function localization effect, whole localization effect, how this changes over different energy scales, briefly touched on the degree of optical linear polarization, and also about Coulomb effects and these things. And last but not least, I obviously haven't done all this on my own. This is in Tyndall, Owen O'Reilly, Daniel Tenner, and Peter Prabok have contributed here. Then Miguel Caro is now a postdoc at Alto. He worked on the local polarization theory. Then Robert, Rob Martin provided samples on aluminum indium nitride. Cambridge, and now also Queen Mary um, in, in London, um, provided samples and, and structural characterization. Phil Dawson's group in Manchester, optical characterization. Michael Moody, together with, with Rachel Oliver, on the um, atom probe tomography, and here all the funders. And with this, I would like to close my talk, and thank you for your attention. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yes, or, well, I, I, good question. I, I'm not sure because, I mean, in the effective mass approximation, it depends on what is your effective mass then. Well, yeah, short answer. <laughs> no, we haven't tried to fit this. So, to what extent could you uh, capture temperature effects separately for electrons and holes? Uh, how would this affect the hole and electron energy differently, presumably because of different coupling funnels, because of the different localization? I mean, uh, in the first place, I would say you would look into, um, when you have a temperature effect, how high or deep do you go into the valence or conduction band. Phonon effects, that is a different story. I have a question. So for the non-polar wells, mm -hmm. my intuition is that the polarization effects are actually going to be larger due to fluctuations because the C-axis is in the plane mm -hmm. and it's kind of a, a separate effect, whereas for, for the polar wells, it, it kind of comes on top of a, uh, the, the overall polarization. Can you comment on that? Can you analyze that? Yes, in principle we can. You can apply an external field and you basically then can cancel the, the, the macroscopic can contribution so that you just flash out the local fluctuations. I would say the fluctuations in a seaplane system may be more important than in a non-polar system because if you think about the slope of the building potential, and you have fluctuations on something that is very large, a small variation in the slope will give you a very different result than basically for your transition energy. But we can discuss it maybe later. I mean, that won't be a short answer. Can you explain, so for M-plane, this anomalously large line width, yeah. and, and all of our experience is it's very narrow at violet, and then it broadens unacceptably large at, at blue for laser applications, and then it narrows again 
with aqua. At least it merges to the seaplane value. There's a large discrepancy. It's worse yeah. than at blue. Yeah. Did your calculations, uh, are they consistent with all the experimental observations on Langlet and the Langlet anomalies? We, ha we haven't done for, for yeah. the we haven't done for the M plane a variety of different calculations for different indium contents. But my personal view, which I can't back up at the moment here, is that you have probably in the nonpolar system other factors like clustering effects that might contribute to the line width. So do you, for your calculation, do you, do you agree with the, about 17%? Do you agree with the experimental line width, or are you narrow? Well, as I said, we had 100 MeV. It was too narrow. And 135 that was measured. So it could be in part due to the, the number of configurations that we have taken, but I assume that there is another factor. And that is, as I said, something that could be clustering. But the, the, the APT was not clear. It's never clear cut, probably, but it's an M plane. When you never, you make computations, you never tell us whether uh, emission uh, energy yeah. corresponds to what is measured. Well, as I said, the PL, excitonic yeah. emission spectra, that was compared to the, to the experimental PL spectra. Okay, so this works well. That works well, and we tried to do the stoke shift calculations for an M-plane system, and there our stoke shift is too small. So, yes, so how, what physics can explain when Good. So this okay. cannot explain. This is a huge problem. And you and 180 is not the biggest one. Martin talks about 300 millivolts. Yeah. yeah. So what is called the band gap is not the band gap when they measure it. It's yeah. Not the band gap. Yeah. So we can no, we, we can keep that for tonight. Yeah. Okay. So it's probably not, not a, a simple answer, <laughs> not a short answer, probably. No, and it's a problem not of only of theory, but also of experiment. Then I was expecting from you, indeed, what was asked by uh, Karpov, uh, by Sergei, which is the comparison between your type binding methods and what you usually use, which is the envelope wave function with mm -hmm. the band variation. Yeah. So if you could comment, comment that later this afternoon, maybe. Yeah, yeah. We, we are because it would be interesting to compare. Yeah. Because then you have this extremely strong whole uh, localization, but of course you cannot get to, to the envelope wave function. So is there a discrepancy? Are you right? And the envelope fun wave function completely wrong? Yeah, I'm al always shying away from saying something is completely wrong. <laughs> well, no, but well, yeah. at least understand the difference. Yes. Okay, yeah. Like yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So now we have a session of uh, 10 minutes talks. And we're starting by Solius from uh, KTH.